Well, greetings and happy Tuesday, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the next part of our parent and family empowerment series. Um, we'll be covering limit setting today, presented by Kate Meyer from the Ensemble Therapy Group. Kate, thank you for being here for another one of our amazing workshops. Yes, thank you for having me. So today we are going to talk about limit setting. Um, before we start that, I'm going to talk a little bit about who I am. Um, so my name is Kate. Um, I work, um, at ensemble therapy and I do the executive functioning coordination and parent support. I also am a school psychologist. And so I work with a private company and we do private psychological evaluations. Um, my background comes from teaching. I taught third grade for many years, and then I was a tech teacher for one year. Um, and then I also have three kids of my own. So, um, you know, I can definitely talk through a little bit of the best practice, which we'll talk through today, and then a little bit more realistic too, and what to have, what to do when, you know, best practice isn't working. So today what we're going to talk about is we're basically going to look at the basics of neurobiology. Um, it is going to be a little heavy post lunch, but, or during your lunch, but I made it super bright. So even if you try to fall asleep, your eyes won't close. Um, and we're going to talk about how that impacts the way that kids respond. Then we're going to talk about the power of choice. Um, by giving and returning the responsibility to your child and we'll reframe and teach you how to do the ACT limit setting model um, to increase your kids' compliance. Um, I don't know why that bar isn't going away, but I'll figure it out. All right, so first we're gonna head to the brain. Um, so like I said, this part's a little bit heavy, so bear with me. Um, there is a purpose to it and I'm gonna try to make it as bright and jaunty as possible. So. This model of the brain with the stairs is from The Whole Brain Child, um, which was a really big book when it first came out. And there's some pieces that I'm going to refer back to from there. Um, if you're ever wanting to read a book um, that has to do with anything from this presentation, I highly suggest it. It's a great book. Um, and so knowing how the brain works is really important for us because we can also understand then how to respond to our children when they need our help. So basically, you know, your brain builds or grows from the bottom to the top, okay? That's the way it develops. That's the way it grows. And that bottom of your brain, your brain stem, that's the part you need for survival. Um, that is the part that is wired to react rather than respond when it comes to stress. And, you know, if you think about it, that's your like, I'm kind of you know, walking, you know, back in like ancient times, like walking through the tall grass and all of a sudden you hear a sound. That's your brainstem going, hey, listen, make sure I don't get killed. Um, and so even though we don't really utilize that part of our brain as much anymore, as far as the fight or flight, it still is there and it still thinks it has a big, important job to do. Um, and so that is what we consider to be, if you look at the image, the downstairs brain. Okay. That's your fight, fight, freeze. Um, and the more complicated part of your brain is the upstairs brain. Um, that's where your executive functioning is housed. That's your prefrontal cortex. And that actually doesn't develop until your mid 20s. So that's why if you have any older kids like teenagers and you're just like, ah, like I feel like they just aren't thinking or they can't think long term. Well, they really can't. Their brain is still developing. So you got to help them. Um, but when your brains become overwhelmed with feelings of like fear or sadness or anger, that's that downstairs brain part. And that's really confusing to kids why they feel so out of control. And so I actually even use this model when I'm talking to kids about their own brains, because it's very simple. You got your pretty little image. Um, if you read the book, he has his own image too. Um, and it's helpful for them to start to have that vocabulary. And you can even use this with like, a three-year-old, maybe even a two-year-old of saying like, you know, you were in your downstairs brain and helping them kind of understand a little bit more about what their body's doing and it, when it feels especially out of their control. Um, so your best case, especially when you're talking to your kids about this, you can say the best case is when that stairway is working, when the messages can get communicated from your upstairs brain to your downstairs brain. And those are the coping skills that kids learn. 
both in their classrooms, um, from their parents. And that helps your brain stay connected. And then, you know, it's very busy because all the messages go up and down. Now, that's when you make good choices. But sometimes our downstairs brain takes over. And that can be really, really hard. It's a good thing because that tells us, you know, if you're in an emergency situation to run fast or, you know, to fight or to hide, um, it keeps us safe. But it can also be a bad thing too when your brain is saying, you should be worried, you should be worried, and you're just being told to brush your teeth and you don't need to go into a full tantrum mode. Okay. So now we're going to do some brain facts, okay? Just so that if I refer to these words, you know what I'm talking about, okay? So we've got the amygdala, and that is in that most primitive part of your brain. Um, I like to call it your alarm system, okay? Its job is to detect danger um, and prepare for emergency. Now, for some people, um, their amygdala is overactive, and that can be a very bad thing because it can mean that you know, you're not good at telling what's a threat from what's not a threat. Um, in young kids or in people who have a history of trauma, oftentimes that amygdala is working overtime. And so we have to get that amygdala to be a little bit more quiet. Um, we can do that through therapy. Sometimes it can be done chemically through medication. Um, but that's, you know, the point of that amygdala is it helps you kind of be aware of what's going on and how to react. Okay. The other part, like I talked about briefly on the other slide, is that prefrontal cortex, okay? And so that's where your decision-making happens. Um, it's something that continues to evolve over time. You learn, and as you learn, your, uh, your prefrontal cortex starts to get better, okay? Now, something that we know is that if someone has an overactive amygdala, um, like they have that trauma history, or perhaps they have, um, you know, they're just a young kid and their body's still figuring itself out. That, that amygdala will sound its alarm and the prefrontal cortex kind of shuts down. And so that's why when your kid is in the middle of a tantrum, or maybe they lean to be a little bit more anxious. And so they're having a big anxious kind of reaction. You can't reason with them. Um, you ask them questions and try to help them think through it. And they're just like, leave me alone or I hate you. You know, all those things. It's because that amygdala is firing all of its messages and alarms at the same time. And the prefrontal cortex is like pieced out and it's going to see you later once that stairway rebuilds. Okay. Um, and so obviously, you know, we as parents want to be able to support our kids in, um, you know, helping create that stairway, have the stairway intact, but it is a good thing for us to recognize that sometimes the stairway is broken and all we can do is reconnect with our kids or try to help them get regulated so that we can begin to have that discussion. All right. So now we're going to talk a little bit about neuroplasticity and mirror neurons. Um, I always think mirror neurons is like the funniest thing to say. I feel like I'm like, I don't know. It's like mirror neurons. I don't know. It's a funny thing. Anyway. So Young kids don't always have the neural pathways to calm their own turbulent behaviors, okay? They just haven't been created. They don't, they don't have that road plan yet. So everything can seem like an emergency to them. If you think about it with a baby, it's hungry. Ah, I'm going to cry. You know, I'm tired. Ah, I'm going to cry. I mean, babies cry all the time. Um, same thing with your little toddler. They, you know, bump their knee and they're just like, ah, the world's falling apart. Um, or they get scared and they can't see around it. They're just so scared. They need you to hold them, oh, 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 you know. Um, and so what our job is to help them regulate. And so they look at you as a parent. They literally will look at you and work with you to de-escalate. And so we'll talk through what that looks like later in the presentation. But you are going to be able to help them regulate. And so knowing, you know, what your baggage or your triggers are, um, will also help you be aware that they're not necessarily pushing those buttons. They just can't see past their own moment. Um, and so they're looking to you to help regulate. And then that's kind of a practice makes perfect thing too. The more you help them regulate and the more they learn to co-regulate with you, the more they'll be able to do it themselves because they'll start to have those pathways built. And for those of you that maybe have more than one child, you might see that in the sibling relationship on a good day, right? I have more than one kid too. It's not an always just on those good days where the older sibling will help the younger kid get regulated. Um, and they'll, you'll hear them using some of the same language you may use or 
using some of the same kind of like eye contact, deep breathing um, to create those new healthy pathways. The, you know, the bad thing is, is that sometimes with that plasticity, we can learn bad behaviors, right? Like this is your kid who learns that if they scream really loud, then you give them what they want. Um, and so it is often harder to change a behavior once it's been learned, right? Because you got to rewire things a little bit. Um, it's, you know, I make it into like chipping away at a block, at a, like a block basically it takes time. You got to introduce the new pathways, but eventually with consistent reinforcement of their behaviors, which we'll talk about next, they'll be able to learn that new behavior and it'll be reinforced. And so hopefully they'll learn when I scream, I don't get what I want. If I want something, I need to ask for it in a polite way. Um, oops, cat alert. Um, never jumps up here except when I'm doing presentations. It's just like, it's just likes to be in the show. Um, okay. So there's lots of different theories about, so now we're a little bit away from the brain part. Okay. The heaviest part is done like, phew. um, so now we're going to talk about some different theories and reasonings why kids misbehave. Okay. So one of the theories is called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So basically what that is, is that you need to have your most basic needs met, like rest, warmth, food, um, before you're able to even feel safe and secure. And that's before you're able to start to build relationships. Um, and so if you have a kid, either your own child or, um, you know, if you're a teacher and you have a child in your classroom and you're like, gosh, they are just, their amygdala is firing. They are really struggling to regulate what is happening. It may be because they don't feel safe because of something going on at home. It may be because their world just got turned upside down because they have a big sociological change in their life. Um, and these things can really impact kids and impact them for a period of time too. So that is just to say to be patient as they go through those changes. It can also be a developmental change. Um, you know, especially when we're looking at our younger elementary kids, when they're about to hit a new stage, you sometimes get a whole bunch of really big, big behaviors that you're just like, where is this coming from? Why is this happening? It's happening because they're about to make a big developmental growth. Um, we also see it with our teens for hormones and preteens, you know, if anybody has a preteen, like you've got some, they've got some hormones firing at all times. So it might be that. So seeing past that as parents and recognizing, is this a moment to teach or is this a moment where I just need to connect and redirect, um, is a big piece of helping set limits and helping understand our kids' behaviors. Um, go to our next slide. So there's if you're looking at the purely behavioristic theories of behavior, I was redundant in saying that, but if you're a behaviorist and you're looking at and trying to understand behavior, you believe that there's four functions to behavior, okay? And the easy acronym you can remember is SEAT, okay? There's sensory, there's escape, there's attention, and then there's a tangible. So that means that no matter what is happening, if you try to understand what the function is, that'll help you understand how best to support it. So, um, and it's always something that they want or don't want. So if we have a kid in the school-based setting that, um, every time at the start of the day after his, his, you know, his grandmother drops him off, he runs, he runs away from the school. So that means that he's trying to escape. Okay. And we look at, okay, why is he trying to escape? Probably because school's scary or because something happened or, you know, he, he's feeling very sad about X, Y, or Z. And so that helps us kind of understand and start to have that conversation. If your kid screams at you every single time you take, a, you know, their electronic away, well, that means that they want that tangible back. Okay. So understanding what it is they're trying to do. If your kid, you know, is pushing peers in class, maybe they're trying to gain attention, but they're not knowing how to do it appropriately. Um, so whenever you talk to someone that is a behaviorist or really looks to these behavior components about behavior, they're always going to be trying to understand what is the function, what is going on that's driving that behavior, and then how can we support and change it? Okay, so, you know, take this next part of the presentation with a grain of salt, but what I'm going to be talking about is uh, if you like a modern approach to discipline. Um, so it's going to be different than maybe the way that our parents raised us um, there, which, you know, 
sometimes feels a little bit uncomfortable as a parent when you're like, Ooh, like, I don't know, I'm not giving a whole bunch of consequences. I'm just, you know, doing this or doing that. And I don't know if that feels right. And so you always have to listen to your parental gut ultimately. Um, but I do think it's important to try some of these strategies, especially if you're having difficulties with your kid's behavior. Um, and I would assume that's why most of you guys are, are here is I'm having trouble setting limits or I'm setting limits and they're not listening to them. What do I do? Um, the only thing I will as a fellow parent heading into the holiday season where we're around a lot of family members, sometimes because it is different than our parents or our in-laws or our grandparents raised us, they might have a lot of questions or not really be understanding the different way that you're approaching the behavior. So, you know, instead of giving a time out when they're crying, you're trying to connect with your child and comfort them. And then once they're able to regulate and talk about it, then talking about why they're crying. Um, and so those are two different approaches. Neither of them are bad per se. They're just different. And so you might have some explaining to do um, going forward. Um, we are going to focus today on intrinsic rewards. Um rather than the extrinsic. Okay. So that means instead of earning, you know, we're not going to talk so much about like, we call it a token economy in the classroom setting, or like if you earn five stars then you get to pick out a prize. Um, and so we're going to focus more on things that you can do to intrinsically motivate them. Now, does that mean that extrinsically motivating your child or if they make their bed, you know, X amount of days in a row, they get a prize. Is that bad? No, again, everyone's going to parent the way that they're going to parent. Um, I'm just suggesting some different ways. I will say, um, you know, in the classroom setting, I find the token economy works a little bit better than at home because we as parents are not consistent. So if you're going to do an external motivator or some sort of token economy, just make sure you're able to be consistent and you're not going to forget about it. Or when you go away for work, you know, it's not going to continue to be implemented, that it's something that's going to be able to consistently be done for a period of time until that behavior support is no longer needed. All right. So, you know, the first thing before we talk about limit setting is I will kind of speak to the fact that limits are really, really important. Okay. Um, and this is something that I believe in my, you know, my, background in early child development. It's something I believed in the classroom. It's something I definitely believe as a parent. Okay. Kids are naturally self-centered. It's not, I'm not meaning that they're egotistical, although they are a little bit. Um, but they are, you know, they're, they're the way their brains develop, they are self-centered. That's why like your three-year-old will cover her eyes and think you can't see her. Um, you can still see her, but because her eyes are covered and she can't see anybody else, she truly doesn't believe that you are there, um, which is just mind boggling, right? Um, and so thinking about their brains as they grow and knowing that it helps a little bit understand that they are more self-centered. So that sometimes they're going to think about themselves first or think about them in that moment, not necessarily all the external factors. And so they need to know that limits are important to help them grow in a way that's going to make them the best possible adult. Okay. It also helps with limits to delay gratification. If we give kids what they want every single time, then they do not know how to delay gratification. And that can be something that can have a negative effect lifelong. Um, we know, you know that people that are able to better delay gratification are people that do better in school, are people that do better at work. And those are the people that you see that have to work hard for a period of time. One of the most famous studies that looks at that is it's called Michelle's Marshmallows, which if you've never seen it, they like recently redid it. And it's probably the cutest thing you've ever seen because they put down two marsh or one marshmallow in front of a kid and they say, I'm going to leave the room. And if you don't eat the marshmallow by the time I get back in, then um, I'm going to give you two marshmallows. And so then they leave and obviously they have a camera on the kid. Now, some kids are able just to sit there and look at it, which I definitely would not have been one of those kids. Some kids will like lick it and then set it back down and like look around or take a little nibble. Some kids will hide from it. You know, it's, it's very adorable. But anyways, what that tells us is that they tracked or Michelle then tracked those kids to into adulthood. And 
his his kind of conclusion that he found, which there's been some flaws found in it um, since then, but was that those children that were able to delay that gratification um, had better success in those ways that I spoke about. Um, and so it's something that we really want to teach to our kids. Um, the next one is it helps really build foundation for social skills. If you don't have any limits, you're not going to be very good with your friends because you're just going to take what you want rather than asking or knowing that you might have to wait. Um, every person that, um, has ever seen like a pre-K classroom or kindergarten classroom knows those kids are learning all of those skills, but you'll see what a good teacher does is they will set limits. So the kids have a barometer of understanding. Okay. This is what I can do. This is what I can't do. Um, it really helps kids feel safe. We know when we look at the different styles of parenting, that the permissive parent, um, is the one that is letting the kids do what they want to do. But those kids are ones that often feel very unsafe. They don't know, is this a thing I can do? Or is it a thing I can't do? And I'm not saying you have to have a limit or a rule for everything. In fact, I suggest highly you don't do that. But what I am saying is that your kids need to know the parameters. It's like telling them the rules of the game before they start the game. Um, it helps them feel more secure and more, more able to experiment and express themselves. Um, it also helps establish some credibility for you as the parent. I am the parent. I'm going to teach you about the limits. That's part of my job in helping you become a good adult. Um, it also helps establish a daily routine, um, which we talked about in a different presentation in past, which is probably still on the Pflugerville, um, it's on the YouTube, but, um, but the daily routine is really important. Having those bookmarks kind of, or benchmarks for your day, beginning of the day, this is our routine. End of the day, this is our routine. After school, this is your routine. And having that flow to it can help them feel more secure. And then they're going to take more control over those parts, which is what you as a parent want is to help them have more autonomy and control. Um, and it also gives us that basis for self-discipline, which is super important, we know, as adults. Sometimes you have to work hard and you don't always get what you want and you don't always succeed. And sometimes you work hard and you do succeed. All right. So now we're going to look at, um, you know, basically like how to identify and understand um what you're trying to do and what they're trying to say. Okay. And so the reframe or the, you know, the modern approach is the goal isn't punishing. The goal is problem solving. And so if you don't take anything away from the presentation, except for one thing, take away that. Okay. So I don't want to punish their behaviors as a way of controlling it because then more and more behaviors are going to come up and I'm going to feel like a, as a parent that I'm playing whack-a-mole and then I'm going to be exhausted and it's not very fun. But instead, if you work with them, almost thinking about it from like a managerial aspect. Like I'm working with you to solve this problem. So you know how better to solve it in the future. Um, so helping identify too, like what your kids triggers are and what their challenges are. All kids, just like all adults have triggers and challenges. Okay. Then figuring out what the reason is for the outburst and then brainstorming alternative strategies for the next time they feel that way. Um, and this kind of goes back to that basic behavioral piece too. We're looking at what's the antecedent, what's the actual behavior, and then what's the consequence? Like what's done next? Um, and so maybe your kid is someone that gets super, super overwhelmed slash excited slash yelly slash kicky um, when they are in a highly stimulable environment, like a grocery store or something like that. Um, and then every single time in the grocery store, they have a huge tantrum because you say no to them for, you know, some sort of extravagant treat or something that they want. Um, so you know what the trigger is. It's a really overstimulating environment. You know what the reason is for the outburst. You told, you gave a hard limit and they could not handle it. So they had the outburst. So then brainstorming the strategies for next time. So one, talking with them, coming up with other ideas or strategies for what to do. Like maybe they just don't want you to forget that they want that. So you take a photo of them with it, or, you know, maybe it's that, your kid gets super overwhelmed when the grocery store is noisy. So you're going to start going to the grocery store at 8 a.m. because it's so much calmer then. Um, and figuring out those kind of pieces and tweaking and that's that problem solving piece. Okay. When anybody, this is your child, your partner, you know, your work associate, um, anyone's having a moment of dysregulation or a freak out, 
the best thing you can do instead of being punitive or I told you so, or let me tell you a lesson about this one is we call it being with attitudes. So basically saying, I'm here. I hear you. I understand if you understand. Sometimes that makes people angry if you say, I understand and you don't. But really what's important is I care. And so sometimes that connection can look like, you know, getting down on their eye level. Sometimes it can look like being quiet, um, which I have a hard time with. <laughs> sometimes it can look like, you know, um, you just kind of, you know, standing next to them or rubbing their back or um, being there when they calm down from whatever the reason is or whatever the outburst is. But knowing first that your connection point is going to be huge. They have to know that you connect with them and you hear them before you can move on to problem solving. Because if someone comes at me when I'm really upset and they're like, well, listen here, Kate, here's what you did wrong. Let me talk to you about that. I'm not going to be super receptive and open to the problem solving. But if someone says to me, I saw what just happened. Whoa, that was really intense. That must have been really scary. Then I'm going to be like, yes, yes, it was super scary. Um, and for your younger kids who aren't as verbal, it might be, you know, something just like eye contact. Do you need a hug? Um, for your teens, if it's something just huge and monumental and it's such the worst problem in the world, it might just be listening. Do you want me to listen or do you want me to help? I'm here to listen. Um, so, um, sometimes parents will say when we're talking about limit setting and behavior changes, um, what about raising my voice? So, um, I think that, um, you know, every parent raises their voice. If you ask my kids, they will say mom always yells, <laughs> which I don't always yell. So that's incorrect, but it is their perception. So I have the issue too. I just have a loud voice as I explained, but, um, anyways, so, um, yelling is something that, you know, it happens. It happens to the best of us. We got to accept it. It's going to happen. Don't beat yourself up when it happens is basically what I'm going to say. But remembering that, like when you yell and you see this in your own kids, what happens is they jump or they shrink down because it gives them that big shot of basically of cortisol coming straight towards their brain and giving them that kind of like, like, wake up, kind of like that amygdala shoots into space. Um, and so when that happens, when stress kind of floods their brain, they're not going to be able to problem solve. They're not going to be able to, you know, um, help you like think through like, hmm, let's talk about why I did that. Like, yeah, let's, let's um, figure that one out. Um, instead, it's going to just teach them that you yell and they jump. Now, I do think yelling has a place. Um, like, let's say they're about to do something really dangerous and you want to kind of spook them into stopping. Then a yell is a great choice. But if you're feeling really frustrated and they're crying and crying or fussing or their siblings are fighting or something like that, a yell is not always the best choice. Um, make sure I said everything I want to say. Uh, the other thing is that if you do end up yelling, um, it is always good to, we call it like repair the relationship. Um, and so basically the way that I do that is I'll say like, Hey, earlier today I lost my temper and I yelled and I know that you don't like it when I raise my voice. You've said before that it really hurts your ears and it makes you feel sad. Um, I'm going to work on not yelling. And next time before I yell, I'm going to take a step outside and take some deep breaths. So what you're doing is you're you're really reconnecting with them, telling them what you did wrong, taking ownership over it, and then giving them some ideas of what you're going to do next. And the coolest thing about that, along with that neuroplasticity kind of component that we spoke about earlier, is that's going to be an alert for them. Like, oh, when I yell, maybe I should try mom's strategy where she goes outside and takes a couple deep breaths. They might not, but they might. Okay. So... What I definitely um, suggest, and this isn't my theory or even my saying, it's from a famous play therapist, is to be the thermostat, not the thermometer, okay? So this is the really tough part for us as parents, okay? We've got to learn to respond rather than react, okay? So what that means is you got to calm yourself because if you're starting to feel like, oh, they're pushing all my buttons or, oh, that's my trigger, and you're starting to become dysregulated, you are not going to be able to help regulate them, okay? It does not help for you to escalate with your kids. You got to calm yourself first, 
and then you can be able to move on and know that not every moment is a teachable moment. So that's okay too. And know that they're working on their behaviors. Sometimes I have to remind myself before I start to escalate as a parent, like, okay, this is not about me. It's not about the fact that, you know, I've been busy with work and haven't had as much time. And that's why they're throwing these tantrums or, you know, whatever it is, I have to be able to kind of figure out for me how I can call myself. Um, because like we spoke about earlier, kids are egocentric. This is not about you. It is most often about them. And if you rise up and react, then they're going to rise up and react. Um, you know, this is something that happens with your toddlers all the way up to your teens. And it also happens with your partner. And so if you can figure out how to respond in a calm manner and keeping those words very short and simple, I promise you'll have better success than if you start to react as well. And so try to think about that, like visualize it. I am a thermostat, not a thermometer. Um, it can really help. It seems silly. It's one of those silly things, but it definitely works. All right. So let's say you're being calm. You know, you're having one of those A plus parenting days. You've almost earned your gold star. Speaking of external rewards, right? Rewards, right? Um, but you're not really getting that desired response. Okay. So, you know, the first thing you have to ask is those kind of Maslow's hierarchy of need questions. Is your kid hungry? Um, have I been paying attention to them? Um, is your kid tired? Um, or would a change of scenery help? Okay. And all those pieces can often help. Sometimes, you know, from your youngest, your oldest kid, if you're like, Hey, I'm going to take a beat and, you know, get out some cheese or get out some apples and, you know, and you just, and they're like, I'm not hungry. And you just kind of put it out. Sometimes they eat and they realize, Oh, I haven't eaten, you know, for the past six hours, I am hungry. Um, and change of scenery. Sometimes if they are, you can tell a teetering, like about to throw a tantrum or even throwing one. Sometimes I'll take them out, out to the backyard and, or take them to the front yard where people may walk by and become distracting. Um, and, um, having the grass under the feet and, you know, having the wind blow through your hair or whatever it may be on these nice days like this, it's definitely an easier thing to do. Um, sometimes even like, you know, spraying feet with water, like anything to help kind of bump out of that, that, that spot that they're in, get them out of that downstairs spraying can be helpful. I'm not saying spray them in the face or anything. I'm just saying like, put some water on the ground with, you know, the hose and splash in the mud, things like that. Um, it also helps to get down on their level. Um, so especially for your sh kids that are shorter than you, um, like your little kids, um, you know, making sure you're really getting down on their level and you're speaking with them and making eye contact with them, right? Because you're trying to loan them your mirror neurons and it's a little hard to do when they have to look way up at you and you're, you're much taller than them. Um, it also helps to kind of hold their hands, keep their eyes secure, and I'm not saying I'm like holding tight or anything like that, but like if I hold out my hands and you offer me your hands or I might rub your hands or some kids like some sensory exercises, like pretending that you're putting mittens on their fingers or something like that can really help de-escalate. Um, making sure you're saying your piece very concisely and then checking for that understanding. Um, and when I say concisely, you know, we find that most kids, what is it, 10 and under, after you've said five words, they start to tune out, which is kind of insane to think about. Um, so I just try to think really clearly what I want to see as far as the behavior or what I am trying to express with what I'm saying. When we are looking at, um, you know, redirecting behavior, setting limits, you know, the most important thing you can really do is, is you know, check that tone of your voice, check your facial expressions, especially if you're really bothered or annoyed. Um, <clears throat> like I suggested that connect before you correct, um, making sure when we talk about consequences next, that they are related to the offense. Um, we say to like in the kind of therapeutic world, replacing time out for time in most of the time, if you look at those four functions of behavior, if kids are repeatedly doing something, they oftentimes want attention from you as the parent, um, which if you have more than one kid, that's really hard. Or if you're just busy or in the middle of work day or something like that, it's hard. It's just hard sometimes. So instead of thinking about how much time it's going to take you to put them in timeout, 
giving them that time, even if it's two minutes. All right, I've got some time. I want to listen to what you have to say. Being really careful that, um, you know, you're um, not shaming them for their behavior um, because shaming doesn't feel very good. I've been shamed. You probably have all been shamed. It's just, it's not something that you feel really good with. Um, and so, you know, I always really suggest trying other methods before shaming, um, cause it definitely is effective, but it doesn't always make you feel very good about it. Um, being careful with how you're teasing them about their behavior. Like, um, you know, like if you have a kid who is a super sloppy eater, um, instead of being like, you know, Oh, you're such a sloppy little mess, aren't you? Or something silly or even sarcastic, be more concise. Hey, I noticed that you have food on your face. Can you please take your napkin and wipe it off? Um, and giving them those cues that way. Um, you know, physical discipline is one that comes up a lot with parents that I work with. Um, cause many of us were spanked. Um, I was spanked. Um, and so we think that that's a good way to, you know, utilize discipline and teach our children about consequences. Um, and I will say, you know, as a parent myself, there's sometimes where I'm like, I would, would love to spank, but it's not about teaching a lesson. It's more like, I'm just like, ah, I'm so frustrated, but that's a good indicator for me that I need to take a break at that time. Um, and so for you as a parent too, thinking, okay, what is, what am I teaching them with phys- my physical discipline? Um, am I teaching them that I hit them when I'm angry? Yes. Do I teach them that I hit them when they do something wrong? Yes. But then it's a little hard to kind of manage it when they hit their siblings, when they do something wrong, or if you see them hitting other kids at school. Um, and it also doesn't really help you connect with them. It helps them be scared of you. So, um, it is something to consider, but is it a quick way to get someone to do something? Yes, that it is, um, for that moment. Um, and also making sure that you're not like isolating or withdrawing warmth or love when you're angry with them or when they've done something wrong. Um, you know, you're not going to be like, don't talk to me. I'm not talking to you for the rest of the day. I am so disappointed with your behavior. Cause then they're just like, ah, like it's okay as a parent to say, I need a minute. I'm feeling super frustrated about what I just saw. Um, but I'm going to come back and talk to you, like make a plan for them. So they aren't just sitting there like sobbing because they feel bad. And now you're going to feel bad and, or just be really angry and, um, making sure that you're going to that connection point and checking your own baggage at the door. Okay. Um, so this kind of piece, um, you know, this is something that comes up a lot with parents when I work with them, or even like when I'm talking, um, about behavior with different like teachers or things like that. I think sometimes we, um, you know, we are looking at their behavior and it's under such a microscope and I'm like, well, you know, I don't like when my cell phone gets taken away from me so I can understand why your teenagers are upset about it, you know? Um, and just understanding that they have human reactions because they're humans. Um, and they're not perfect. Um, and I'm not letting, I'm not saying like, let them get away with it or anything like that. All I'm saying is just teach them to be better, you know, teach them that it's not okay, um, to, you know, take out their frustration in that manner. Um, and it's not acceptably rude to people. Um, and, but you got to hold yourself to that higher standard as well, because we aren't robots either. And sometimes we, as parents have bad days, um, And so we need the same grace that we give our, you know, that we're now trying to express upon our kids. Um, Because stress makes all of us a little bit more um, frustrated and less tolerant than we typically may be. So just checking, again, checking your own behavior. Be the thermostat, not the thermometer. Okay. So looking at kind of the basics, like the 101 of limit setting, okay? So limits provide structure to your environment and relationships so kids can feel secure, okay? A lot of kids have trouble controlling their own impulsiveness and they need that security, okay? But we as parents and caregivers have to recognize which kids need which kind of limits and how many limits they need. My kids are very different in the limits that they need. Um, And it's not just by age, it's that, you know, one of them does fine with a whole bunch of limits and the other one, you know, if you give any limit, will question and buck against it and needs to kind of experience things for themselves within the safety parameters that we give. But 
needs to figure out what the limits are and then they can come back and say like, okay, so now I understand about this limit. I mean, they're not going to say it in that wonderful way that I just expressed it, but um, that would be delightful. Um, but understanding that limits are important, but different people need different limits. Okay. So within those limits, you're helping them define what their boundaries are and feel that safeness. Like I said, um, limits are only presented when the kid really needs them. Okay. Um, we do want to give them as much freedom to explore as they can. So that means that like, you might not have a lot of limits in a place that you've never been because you don't know what the limits are yet, but you can explore and figure them out together and making sure when you are discussing those limits is, you know, is it necessary for the safety of your child? Is it necessary for the safety of others? That's a really, really big one. Um, and is it necessary? Well, I got to see it for the protection of like themselves or the safety in those areas. Okay. So when you are setting those limits with your kids, it's really hard for them to remember a lot of different rules. Okay. Um, and so something that they might experience is like, if you have too many rules, they can't really kind of fully express themselves, right? Because they don't remember, am I allowed to do that? Is that something that's against the rules? Am I going to get in trouble for doing that? Um, so making sure that if you are going to give a boundary or a limit that you're making sure it's super clear, making sure it's super concise, and then also making sure it's very concrete. Like there's no wiggle room around it. Okay. And remembering the objective is not to stop the behavior, but to facilitate like the expression of their, like the motivation or feeling that, that they're wanting in a more express, in a more acceptable manner. Okay. So what I mean by that is that basically I'm not just trying to be punitive and say like, no, but trying to help them figure out how to be able to do what they want to do. When we talk about limits and limit setting for families where the kids might go to grandma's after school or um, the parents might be living in separate homes and have different rules. Parents will say, well, we have to have the same rule. Otherwise it's going to be too hard for them. Um, I think that might make you as a parent go kind of crazy. And so I always highly suggest in those times when there are separate homes that kids are able to code switch. Okay. Granted, if your kid is getting like a whole bunch of TV time in one home and they come to another home, it's going to be a bumpy code switching, but it, they are able to code switch. So, you know, as much as possible, having the same framework, yes, but you don't have to have the exact same rules because you have different people and you have different homes. Okay, so when we look at that um, ACT method, okay, so you've determined whether the limit is necessary. And now what you're going to do is you're going to acknowledge their feelings, wants, needs, desires. That's your first point, your connection point, right? You're going to communicate what the limit is. And then you're going to give them two alternate behaviors that they can do to kind of achieve that same goal. Um, if there's no change in the behavior, then you're going to restate that limit. Okay. And this is just an easy way to remember it. Um, this is something that is used in play therapy and in the therapeutic setting to set limits. You probably have also seen if you've ever watched your kid on a field trip with their teacher, you've seen good teachers doing this in a natural way. Okay. So an example of this is like the parent saying like, you know, you're really angry at me. And the kid's like, yeah, I'm going to hit you. Or they're just going to like walk over with their fists all angry. Um, and the parent's like, you're so angry at me that you'd like to hit me, but people are not for hitting. And the kid's like, you know, you can't stop me. Nobody can. And so then the parent does that, you know, first we're going to acknowledge you're so powerful that no one can stop you, but here's my limit. I am not for hitting, but you can punch that stuffed animal or we can have a pillow fight because they obviously want to get out that like, um, and so you can see what the, like what the example, well, I wrote it. What I did in the example is that, you know, acknowledgement and then you're going to set that limit and then give the two alternatives. So this is often a question that comes up, um, because, guess what? It's not always going to work. Like sometimes it works and it's like magic. Like I guarantee you the first couple of times you're going to try it, it's going to, well, I can't guarantee you. Most of the time when you first try it, your kids are like, what are you doing? Like, and then it kind of works because they're just like, what? Or they're so pleased that you're connecting with them about it rather than just being punitive. Um, 
but eventually it's not going to work. Okay. So you can repeat it, especially if they're really in an intense moment and you feel like they're not hearing you. And then you can go to that ultimate limit. Okay. So we don't really want to use the ultimate limit very often um, because it creates distance in the relationship. And you as a parent really want to connect with your kids. Um, one, because that feels good as a parent, but two, that's how we're trying to help teach them, right? We don't want to so much use our authoritative parenting like role very often or that card very often because eventually it's going to stop working as well. And we're not going to be able to teach them as much about their behavior. Um, and then the other thing we have to think about when we talk about the um, ultimate limit is, you know, with little kids, little consequences, bigger kids, bigger consequences. And we're going to talk about consequences in the next slide. Um, I often will try to like reword, um, you know, when I'm giving that ultimate limit, like I'll reword into choices. So going back to the hitting one, like if you choose to hit me, you choose not to have a use, usual pl piv uh, like privilege. Or, um, if you choose, you know, if you choose not to hit me, you will get to do that. Um, and so that's that ultimate one, which you don't really want to utilize that often. So. When you do use that ultimate limit and you give a consequence, um, there's different types of consequences that we as parents can give. I'll be honest, like, um, I don't really like to give consequences. Now, this is not saying that I don't do it, but I, I find consequences to be cumbersome, okay? Because sometimes they affect me as a parent, which isn't, like, frankly, it's annoying sometimes. Like, I'm not going to give a consequence where I take away TV time because that really punishes me. Um, because then instead of, you know, their usual TV time or electronic time, we're doing something else. Um, and then it's more on me as the parent to figure out what we're going to do. And now I got a cranky kid. Um, so I do. So we'll talk through consequences and then I'll kind of talk through some of the ways that I do consequences or redirect that behavior choice. But this isn't something that I'm like, given out, you know, like consequence, 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 because it's just hard to keep up with too, as a parent, especially if you have more than one kid. Um, so if you're going to like punish them for a period of time, you as a parent have to maintain and remember that punishment for that whole period of time. All right. So kind of going back to that psych 101 behaviorism, we're going to kind of look at the law of effect. And so basically consequences occur and what they do or what they're supposed to do is teach you that a behavior that is followed by an unpleasant consequence is is likely to be stopped, okay? At least this is the studies that we've seen in animals. Now, it doesn't always work in kids. They are higher cognitive beings. So just because I give you a consequence for your behavior, if you really want to do it again, you're going to do it again, um, which is why consequences sometimes don't work. Um there are two main types of consequences. There is natural and then there is logical. So natural consequences are delightful because they're natural. You as a parent really don't have to do much. Like if you, um, you know, if you pour out your cup of orange juice, there's no orange juice. You don't have any orange juice, you know? Um, and so that's a natural consequence. A logical consequence is ones that parents give. Parents don't give natural consequences because they occur within the environment. Um, another natural consequence is like you push your friend, your friend doesn't want to play with you. That's a natural consequence, right? Because I don't like to play with people that push me. Um, and so as a parent, we give logical consequences, okay? And society and nature, like, um, I'm sorry, not nature, that's natural. Society gives its own set of consequences as well, right? Like if I break the law, I get punished. If I break it really bad, I get punished in a really bad way, okay? So we as our parents, through consequences, can teach the kids these different lessons, okay? So it is helpful, you know, for um, us as parents to give a consequence that's tied to the behavior, like I mentioned earlier, Okay. So like if your teen won't get off their phone at dinner and you've asked them, you've connected, hey, I know you really want to be on your phone, but now is not the time for you to be on your phone. You can choose to text your friends before or after dinner. And if they look at you and roll their eyes and look back at their phone, well, then a logical parental consequence that I would give is, hey, we don't have technology at the table. Nobody gets to have their phones at the table now. <laughs> you know, so that's a logical one that I as a parent am giving and have given. Um, and so 
Um, another consequence is always to be, you know, like I try to make sure the punishment fits the crime. Like if you pour out your orange juice and you don't have any orange juice, bummer. You also have to clean up your orange juice, which is a definite another bummer, right? Um, always having them kind of clean up is is one that's a, a huge consequence. And we always talk about, you got to make it right. Um, so taking that responsibility for your actions, um, but also, you know, making it right um, is the way that we really focus on in our, in our household and is one of the suggested ways, at least when we're looking at behavior and consequences. Okay. No, too, I will say, um, if you are having them clean it up, make sure you're setting them up for success, depending on their age. Um, if you start this, when you go home tonight, don't expect that your 11 year old knows how to clean up after themselves. If you've never asked them to do it. Okay. Um, you got to start by teaching. So, Hey, I have a basket of cloths and some spray. And if you make a mess, you know, let me show you how to do it or starting to engage them in that cleaning component. But kids as young as two can use, you know, a sprayer and cleaning up cloths. Um, now I'm not saying give your two year old a bottle of bleach, but you can put some vinegar, mix it with water. Um, maybe even some like lavender essential oil, if you want it to smell good, they are going to spray and clean up their messes. All right. Um, oops, sorry. The cat was trying again. Um, I do want to say, oh, I said, um, before I go to the last slide, one of the things that, um, you know, is a great way to provide a consequence. If you've gone to that ultimate limit is by, having them do something like I took it like saying if they're taking your time and you're giving them a consequence, they've got to give you that time back. So it might be doing chores with you or emptying the trash or something that can be done within a 24 hour period rather than taking away something they love, like their phone or their tablet. Um, but rather something that they can do around the house to make the house a better place. Um, and coming at it from that more positive kind of side of things. Um, let me click to my last slide right here. Okay. That's it. That's limit setting in a nutshell. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of time. If anyone has any questions, um, there's our contact information, both for ensemble therapy and then also for Hill country school psychology services. Um, does anybody have any questions for me? My gosh, I answered everybody's questions. That's amazing. Um, let me make sure you can put your questions in the chat. If you have any questions in the chat about limit setting, otherwise you're always welcome to email me. You have both my, both of my email addresses. The hello ad is our general one for ensemble. And then the Kate at is um, directly to me um, as well. Kate, for covering limit setting, a lot of yeah. what you said is kind of what we're going towards in education um, and public education is kind of like the restorative piece to it, the restorative discipline piece mm -hmm. um, to where we are like trying to get them to understand what they did and to make those corrections and fix it on their own um, with those consequences. Uh, just so you guys know, this has been recorded. I will add it to our YouTube um, channel. If you don't know, we do have a YouTube channel for our parent and family engagement workshops, and it is at PFISD Parent Family Engagement. Um, I'll send that link out to you all after I get it added to um, the page. There's already 10 videos there on various topics. Um, Kate has done most of them with us with Ensemble Therapy. We are very appreciative of her. And as always, you can let either one of us know if you have any questions or if you what you guys want to see next, what you want to learn more about. Um, thank you for your time. It's 1256. We did a really good job of staying within that hour. I appreciate you all and y'all have a good day. Thanks, Kate.